know the vibes. It's the Hoop Genius Podcast, Monday morning, coming at you live and direct. It's your boy, Mo, alongside BJ Armstrong, presented by NBA 2K22. BJ Armstrong, the first weekend of the NBA playoffs in the books. It felt almost wrong not having a podcast over the weekend, but we were busy. We were on TV doing the games breaking down all this action and what a weekend of action it was. So what we're going to do for all of you guys who might have missed a game or two here or there, we're going to break down every single bit of the action live and direct right here on the Hoop Genius Podcast presented by NBA 2K22. So BJ, how are you doing first of all? How was your weekend? Real name, no gimmicks. <laughs> Mo, I'm in basketball heaven right now. I'm in basketball heaven. That's right. It's just games. It's games. Yeah. And it's amazing games. It, it, it's incredible, incredible games. Mm. You know, Mo, the, it, this playoffs, it's been a couple years, you know, because of the pandemic. Mm. The game has taken on a kind of a new direction because of COVID, so forth and so on. However, it's awesome when the game returns back to form. It always gets back to the essence of how this game is played. And out here watching the games, what a phenomenal game today that we, you know, got a chance to, you know, we, you know, you and I were working the game. Oh, uh-huh. your Boston Celtics. Uh-huh. Brooklyn. Uh-huh. It was incredible. It was incredible. That was the incredible. game of the weekend for me. But let's take it back to Saturday. What we're going to do is we're going to put four minutes on the clock and we're getting four minutes to break down each of these games. Oh, we so, got four minutes? Oh, the time. That's where the great, four minutes. That's where the great players all play. Exactly. In the last four minutes. Exactly. Of so you, you know, know what? <laughs> Come on, man. You see the vibes? <laughs> okay, the time well, let's do it. <laughs> starts now. So we're going to take okay. it back to the first game of the playoffs. That was on Saturday. And we had the Luka Doncic less Dallas Mavericks hosting the Utah Jazz. The Utah Jazz came away with a 99 to 93 win. BJ, what jumped out to you in that one? Well, what really jumped out is it was a 99-93 game minus mm. Luka Doncic. So, you know, I'm not sure, Mo, what you think about what's going on up there in Utah, but something doesn't look right to me. Something doesn't look right to me, Mo. You know, you're minus Luka. I know you're on the road. I know it's the playoffs. It should have been a blowout. Well, it should have been more convincing. Yeah. Yeah. You know, when you have an opportunity, especially in the playoffs, to win, make a statement, you have to do it. Now, they did win the game. But I wasn't like, you know, like, okay, they're their overwhelming favorite. And that's the way I feel minus Luka Doncic. You know, he's out. I'm not sure. He may miss the entire series. However, this Dallas team is still playing with confidence, especially after one game. And they play it like they had a chance to win, and they did have a chance to win. So that's the way I feel about it. Give give Utah credit. So, but you know, I wasn't I wasn't convinced. Here's what jumped out to me: Rudy Gobert did a great job on the ball, 17 rebounds. However, he took one shot in the entire contest. He did not score it. He hit five free throws. Uh, Donovan Mitchell, 30 points in the second half came up for them big time because it was looking kind of embarrassing in the first half. But the thing that I loved most from Utah was Bojan Bogdanovic saying, hey, listen, Dallas, you're going to put your two best defenders on Conley and Mitchell. So they put Reggie Bullock and Dorian Finney-Smith on the guards. And so Bojan Bogdanovic was like, hey, listen, I don't know if you know about me, but if you put a smaller guy on me, I'm just going to put them on the block. So he went to his post-up bag, which we've not seen it probably since he plays for his national team. So unless you watch European basketball, you've probably not seen this side of Bojan Bogdanovic because in the NBA, he just shoots three pointers. He was posting guys up, hitting post fades on them, you know, doing his work in the paint. I love to see he finished with 26 points. It's a nice wrinkle that the Utah Jazz put in that the Dallas Mavericks are going to have to address moving forward into that one. But, you know, that Luka Doncic is not scheduled to return for game two either. That's kind of a concern for Dallas. They hung around. They could have won this one. But I don't think they're ultimately going to have enough without Luka Doncic to pull it back. If Luka returns for game three, though, do you think Dallas could win four of the remaining, you know, of the remaining games in the series? Well, this series, this series hinges on the health of Luka Doncic. So I know he has a calf strain. At least that's what's being reported. It's very unfortunate. 
you know, because, you know, Luca is a, you know, he's a, he's a top 10 player and he is missed without question the way he plays. He controls tempo. We'll see if he's healthy and he can play and he can play 35 plus minutes. I'm going with the Dallas Mavericks. However, when you have a calf injury, you're mm-hmm. limited. Your mobility yep. is limited. Especially, I'm not sure. Yeah, go ahead. It's especially Lucas' game, which is predicated on he's not the quickest player, but what he does a great job of is starting and stopping. His acceleration and deceleration is elite. And this is like Paul Pierce. He was great at starting and stopping real quick. He might not have the highest top speed and he might not have the quickest acceleration, but his ability to change pace. And a lot of that comes from your cast when you're trying to decelerate quickly. So I don't well, have Mo, the Dallas Mavericks winning this. Yeah, you should you should really identify with Luca because Luca can put you on his hip. And Mo, I would imagine <laughs> <laughs> that's part of your game. <laughs> yes, sir. Hey. Uh, you know, I don't know about the stopping and starting part. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I think that's a nice way of saying he can put you on his hip, yep. Mo, right? <laughs> and, <laughs> and ride you to the basket, you know? So <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, that's the first one in the books. The second game that we saw was probably my favorite game of Saturday night. And it was the Minnesota Timberwolves going into Memphis and witnessing a woman trying to chain herself to the basket and then coming away with the win. She did. Well, well, they cut it off the feed. So the feed I was watching, the cameras just went to to the huddle. They didn't show us what was going on. So I had to rely on people I knew inside the arena to translate me videos of what was happening. And I want to know if she You got people inside the arena, Mo? You got people? I got people Mo, you got people? I got people everywhere. (laughs) I got eyes all over. I got (laughs) eyes all over. Shouts to the Memphis family. I want to know if she's related to the lady who tried to super glue her hand to the floor of the arena in the playing (laughs) game. I don't know what's going on with NBA fans. I know we've all been locked in the house for a couple of years, but let's remember how to behave. I don't know what what it was, a protest. I don't know. I don't want to offend anyone. But they went into Memphis and secured the 130 to 117 win. We spoke about this last week. Anthony Edwards, bona fide superstar, one of the best playoff debuts we've seen. 36 points. Carl Anthony Towns had 29 and 13. Uh, Malik Beasley came off the bench in 20 th- with 23 points and he turned up to the game wearing the same suit he wore on his way out of prison which I thought was a nice touch for him congratulations Jabarant 32 points but it wasn't you know it, it didn't feel like a 32 points from Jabarant you know it, I, I didn't feel his impact the one thing for me uh, looking at the Grizzlies was Jaron Jackson Jr seven blocks in 24 minutes now the seven blocks is great but only being able to stay on the floor for 24 minutes because of foul trouble that's not so great. But BJ, what's your takeaways from this one with the young Timbles coming away with a W? Well, you know, first I'm going to put some respect and call him Mr. Anthony Edwards. Oh. Ladies and gentlemen, let me reintroduce him to you. There was a reason he was the number one pick. Yes, sir. And Anthony Edwards, okay, is a superstar. I'm not going to wait until next year and after he's named to the all star team and all NBA team, Anthony, Mr. Sorry, Anthony Edwards is a superstar. Mo, you heard me say it, called it before it happened. When the light, when the lights are shining brightest, Mr. Edwards shows up. That's what we said. Okay. And shouts to Alex because he, that's uh, his team. He, he used okay, that in his, his press his conference team. too. Shout out to Anthony. Hey. We see you, my brother. Hey, hey, hey. He is a star of stars. This kid is fearless. He's playing on raw ability, but he has a feel for, and he has a knack for timing of taking big shots. I mean, his ability to finish at the basket, his jump shot, create he can create space. He has a little post game pure with him. Hooper. We do. Yeah, he, he's a pure he's, hooper. He, 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 he's a he, he, he's a baller. I, I'm just go. I'm going. I'm going to say this right now. Anthony Edwards is a top ten talent, and I expect him next year. A top ten. Mo, I didn't hesitate. He's a top ten talent. You. He's up there with the best okay. at his position. And I'm going to say this right now. It's his team, and he is learning how to play on the other end from Mister Pat Beverly. Mm, I love the leadership. I, you love absolutely. I love it when the veterans. I love it when the veter- veterans cuff the young guys, and and show them why we play. 
You know, it's not about it's not about the money. It's not about the fame. It's not about social media. You know why we play? You know why they cheering your name, Mr. Edwards? Because you won the game. Mm. And I love this. This kid is a winning basketball player and he competes at a high level. And I can't wait to see where his career ends up. I really can't. I'm excited for him. Mm -hmm. You know what? The Timberwolves and what they're doing. And this game, I give this kid credit because he he didn't just play in the play in. He came into the playoffs and showed out. Now, one, one thing that's funny is he's already on, you know, he's creeping up the Minnesota all-time playoffs scoring leaderboard because he's only played one game, but that's how weak the history of the Timberwolves is. And I think by the end of game yes. four, he'll be top 10 in their highest ever postseason scorers. He's a big-time player. I love what I saw from Anthony Edwards. We're going to keep an eye on that series. And I know BJ has got a scorching hot take that I'm not going to share with you guys, but he rang me with a trade proposal that he'd love to see. We're going to discuss that later in the week. But for now, we're going to talk about the, the Philadelphia 76ers being the first team to win at home on Saturday. You know, the first two games were won by road teams. They defended home court with a 131 to 111 win over the Toronto Raptors. And I feel like Doc Rivers was listening to the podcast because I'd like to apologize to Doc Rivers. He came in with an excellent game plan. His Philadelphia oh. 76 is stuck to the great game plan. And I would also like to shout out to Doc Rivers because why, guess what, BJ? DeAndre Jordan saw zero minutes. He ran with Paul Reed instead. Just like I said in the episode last Thursday, which is where we left it. So, Doc, if you're listening, I'm glad you took that on board. And it clearly worked because the Philadelphia 76 has came away with the win. Tyrese Maxey, the standout player, 38 points. Joel Embiid, 19, 15. But the main thing with Joel Embiid, it might not show up in the stats, was he was commanding so much attention the defense was swarming him and he was finding those looks for his teammates. James Harden had 14 assists, 22 points. And, you know, it's kind of a, a, a sad one, a sad one though, because Scotty Barnes looked like he got injured. I'm not sure on his status heading into game two, uh, but I know Gary Trent Jr. and Scotty Barnes are both injury risks now after what unfolded. What did you see from this game? Well, what I saw was something you don't see very often in the playoffs. When you're third and fourth options, Okay, mm. talking about Tyrese Maxey and Tobias Harris when they scored 38 points and 26 points mm -hmm. respectfully. That's a tough team to beat. Okay, make no doubt about it. Joel Embiid is option number one, he's option number two, and then James Harden. <laughs> but Tyrese Maxey came up big when you get 38 points from the third option. Nine times out of ten, you're gonna win that game. So great offensive game. Uh, by Tyrese Maxey. Tobias Harris really stepped up. Now, when you see something like this in the playoffs, it could be by design. So we'll see in game two. I can't wait to see this, see game two. And chess match. I love it when they make the adjustments uh, during the game. So we'll see what they're going to take away, what they're going to live with. Clearly, a lot of this is going to be dictated by the, by the health of the team. Yeah. But however, however, I will say this. Doc Rivers had a nice game plan. And you know what I love, Mo? Mm -hmm. I love the spacing that you saw the team play with. Yeah. Now, Doc Rivers has made a big adjustment. It's only been one game, but I saw he made his adjustment. I want to point this out to our to our to our listeners here. Doc Rivers played Tyrese Maxey with the second group mm -hmm. and only kept James Harden with the first group. And to me, that allowed them to play much faster mm -hmm. because James Harden had to play at the pace of the team. Yeah. The and reason he had to play a certain way. So I love that. I thought Doc Rivers has made clear yeah. adjustments the, uh, and finding the combinations that work. And we'll see how this is going to work as they go through the playoffs. And hopefully, like, I think Philly should win this, but I don't think Toronto's going to go away easily. Yeah, I think with the injuries to Scott Barnes, Gary Trent, I think it's going to be tough for Toronto. So the reason why James Harden's only sticking with a starting unit is because when he's on the court without Joel Embiid, the numbers are actually horrendous. So I think yes. it's a wise decision to keep him with Embiid. I think this series is going to be won or lost by who's the second best player in the series. You know, Joel Embiid is obviously going to be the best player. But the Toronto Raptors need either Siakam or Van Vliet to be the second best player in the series because Siakam had 24, Van Vliet had 18. Those weren't super, superstar performances that we need from them, especially if they're in consideration for all NBA teams. They need to be the second best player in the series. If one of the Philly players is, then it's going to be over and the Philadelphia 76 is going to win. But speaking of that, you know, having the clear-cut best player in the series, and, you know, we spoke about this before, the Denver Nuggets and the Golden State Warriors. Uh, the Golden State Warriors took care of business quite easily at home. Mm. But... The Denver Nuggets have the best player in the series, Nikola Jokic. But then after Nikola Jokic, the Warriors have second, third, fourth, fifth, 
sixth, maybe seventh best player on the Golden State Warriors. And guess what? Steph Curry was returning to action. We spoke about him coming off the bench, or I suggested it on the podcast last week, and the Warriors maybe were listening because that's what they went with. And then Jordan Poole was in the starting lineup. And boy, oh boy, did he make the most of the opportunity. 30 points in his playoff debut for Mr. Jordan Poole. They were having a pool party. He was making a splash as he sent the oh, Denver Nuggets oh, down the stream. Oh, oh, oh. See the wordplay, see the bars. Uh, <laughs> yeah. you, know, you know, I, I think this is... This is tough for Jokic because out of every team they could have played in the West, I think the Warriors are the worst matchup for him just on a defensive end. And it's not because he's a bad defender, but it's just because when he plays in that drop coverage, they're going to shoot the three ball. And if he plays up, they're going to blow by. And it's just, you know, it's just, it's just bad. So I'm expecting the Warriors to take care of this one pretty swiftly. We saw that the Devon Nuggets mm. really ain't got it outside of Jokic. I know Will mm. Barton gave him 24, but I mean... I mean, I'll, you watched the game. What do you think? I, I think the Warriors could sweep this one. Well, you know, anything is possible, and I'm not going to put anything past the Warriors. However, when you have the best player in the series, I should be able to put together a game plan and win a couple games, especially at home. Mm-hmm. Okay? Now, when I watched this game, out of all the games in the first day, this was the most disappointing game to watch. Why? Okay. You know, Mo, when you're when you're playing, I want to say this. I'm going to get out of quickly because I know we're going into things. You use a regular season to figure out how to play during the regular season. OK. So that you can win in the playoffs. You figure out the pace. And the, 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 the how quickly you want to play or how slow you want to play, whatever you whatever it is you're trying to do. Now, Mo, let me ask you a question real quick. If I'm playing the Golden State Warriors, why am I trying to outrun the Golden State Warriors? <laughs> Foolish. Okay. All right, Mo. Out of all the games, I was disappointed that the Denver Nuggets were trying to play just as fast or faster than the Golden State Warriors. You have the biggest and you have the best player on the floor. Okay, when you play on the road in the playoffs, Mo, you have to play a style that's going to allow you an opportunity to win this game. That means you got to dictate the tempo and slow this thing down. Mm -hmm. Okay, Mo just told me every advantage that the Warriors have by taking advantage of Jokic and give the Warriors credit because they put Jokic and they included him in every defensive game plan. They ran all the plays at him. Draymond Green was extremely oh, active amazing. on the offensive end for him, right? I mean, he had and like he 12 did a, points or so. And he did a great job of guarding Jokic. Okay, and and Draymond's like 6'6". Six, so, six. He did a great job of guarding Jokic. So they're going to make, they're going to force Jokic in every screen roll. They're going to put him in every defensive play so that he has to play on both ends of the court. However... Mm-hmm. It is important for the coaches of the Denver Nuggets to say, okay, that's fair. That's fine. I'm going to slow this game down and I'm just going to play big boy basketball Mm -hmm. because this, all these guys shooting threes on the road, that's the golden state warriors. Jordan Poole had 30 for 30. Both teams. He had 30 points. Both teams attempted 35 three pointers. Okay. Now when you are on the road trying to win a game, against a veteran team, you got to play a different style of play. So I didn't understand what was going on here. I didn't know if they, it was, they got out of character, but you can't tell me coach Malone was telling them you're going to outshoot Steph Curry, Clay Thompson, (laughs) Jordan Poole, and all of that. And then you sitting here with Jokic who has a clear advantage. So I was a little disappointed. I I was like, I, I, I was disappointed. I wasn't a little disappointed. I, I was extremely disappointed in Aaron Gordon. Three for 10 from the field. He had a very disappointing performance well, compared to what I was I, expecting I, I, from him because I know well, the, the potential that he has. Uh, also, Jeff Green, who BJ hoped to deliver a 30 piece, had seven points, uh, which is going to need to be improved upon. But those were Saturday's matchups. Then Sunday, the Miami Heat, they blew away the Atlanta Hawks. There's not much to say about this. It feels like unless the crowd is booing Trey Young, he can't turn up because the crowd weren't too bothered about him and he wasn't too bothered about scoring. He went one from 12 from the field, zero from seven from three point nine. He shot 8.3% from the field. 
Um, this might be the worst Trey Young performance I've seen. But well, you know what? I think. Okay, the, listen. Yeah, go ahead. We got to yeah. get Trey Young a credit. We got to get Trey Young a, a, a pass on today. Okay. And here's why we got to give the whole Atlanta Hawks team a pass. They played, you know, one game on when was that Friday Tuesday night. night or something? Yeah. Yeah, oh, oh, yeah. Night. Before that, yeah. Oh, yeah. Tuesday night or Wednesday night. Wednesday night. Then they turn around and play, you know, I think in Cleveland, right? They beat yep. Charlotte at home. Then yep. they fly to Cleveland when Friday night. Then they had to fly back. Then they had to fly back to Atlanta Saturday, get some clothes, and then fly to Miami Sunday with one game preparation. Early tip. Okay. Lunchtime tip. Yeah. And on America. the early, yeah. So, you know what? That was a game. If they would have won that game, I would have been way, way impressed. Yeah. They had no chance to win that game. Now, game two, however, I expect a better effort. So yeah. I'm going to wait for them to get there. That's just almost impossible to win that, right? Mo, yeah. that's impossible. I don't, I don't want to well, maybe you could do it, Mo. Maybe you could do it, but no one else could do that. You can't have I, that kind of, kind of turnaround. I, 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 I want to give a shout out. Duncan Robertson, eight from nine from three-point land. He struggled a little bit this season. They brought him off the bench, starting Max Struess. I love the trust in Max Struess from Rex Polster. Uh, Duncan Robertson, 9 of 10 from the field for 27 points to lead the Heat. But we got to talk about the game of the day. The game that we covered live on television. The <laughs> world-famous <laughs> Boston Celtics, the greatest franchise in sports history, taking on the Brooklyn Nets. And uh, what a game. Where do I begin with this? I feel well, like it Mo, might take begin, a bit more than four begin, minutes. Mo, but, uh, let's begin with the game. Great game. Amazing it's game. It's one game. Now, amazing. finish the series. Now finish oh, 100%, 100%, 100%. it. 100%. 100%. I just think it was a great run from the Brooklyn Nets, especially from Kyrie Irving, who I think he hit 13 straight points without missing a shot. When KD went to the bench to rest for a little bit, he got the Nets back into the game almost single-handedly. He did a great job, but they just couldn't get it done in the final few seconds. The Celtics defense clamped them up. They got out in transition. They did a great job of trusting each other, not calling a timeout. Jalen Brown looked like he was going to take a layup. He made the extra pass to Marcus Smart, who looked like he was going to shoot a three, and he made the pass to a cutting Jason Tatum. Kevin Durant was stood still. He had no idea where Jason Tatum was. I think Tatum was going to try and crash the offensive glass, ended up catching the ball, a beautiful pirouette, spin move around Kyrie Irving at the buzzer to secure the win at home. The Celtics go up one zip, and I think that's huge because it would have been a bit of a, sh a shaker for them to be down. 1-0 to the Brooklyn Nets after the first game. So, in my opinion, it doesn't matter how you win in the playoffs. It's just about winning because that's all that counts. Game one's in the books. Now you focus on game two. And I want to look at it like this. I think the Celtics can improve. I don't think they had a great game, especially in that fourth quarter. Their offense was horrible. They missed a bunch of layups. They missed a bunch of shots in the paint. They missed a bunch of open shots. Their defense wasn't the best in that third and the fourth quarter. I think they can look at the tape and improve. For the Brooklyn Nets, Kevin Durant, Got, I wouldn't say locked up, but he had a quiet night by his standards. 23 points, three for, uh, on nine from 24 from the field, one from five from downtown. The Celtics did a great job keying on him defensively. Kyrie, on the other hand, exploded for 39. I don't know if Kyrie can do that every night, but I also know Kevin Durant won't be that quiet offensively every night. So I think that'll balance it out. What stood out to you and what are you looking to in game number two? Well, the thing that really stood out to me in this game was the following. The size of the Boston Celtics really affected Brooklyn. Yep. They out-rebounded them by a crazy amount, 43 to 29. Okay. So the size really stood out to me. You know, when you're playing, you know, Bruce Brown, mm -hmm. Seth Curry, Goran Dragic, Patty Mills, you know, you just can't play especially in the playoffs yeah because right? the Celtics are playing, playing two bigs so they put Drummond yes. on Al Horford Al Horford spaces the floor because he can shoot and you're left with Seth Curry who's about 6'1 6'2 guarding Daniel Tice right. who's 6'10 6 6'11 6 and anytime a shot goes up he can attack the offensive glass so that's where now, go ahead no the only thing there's one thing that I'm really concerned about if I'm a Boston Celtics they only have one player that can match up with Kyrie Irving, and his name is Marcus Smart. They only think, have one player. I think Jalen Brown did a good job in stretches. I'm just saying what I see. Yeah. Doing a good job 
in stretches is not good enough if you're going to win. <laughs> he was good enough tonight, okay. and I'll live with it. <laughs> okay. No, he wasn't good enough tonight. But by my, by my count, Kyrie had 39, right? Kyrie yeah. was cooking. In a loss. Kyrie was cooking tonight. Okay. Marshall now, now, you can say loss. This is a series. Mm. You, know, you got it. First team to four. Okay. First team to four. Just go win this. Now, I told you then when they were – when when – Brooklyn was up three. I said, this game is not over. It's not over. Why? Because you have to get a stop, Mo. And what has been the Achilles heel of the Brooklyn Nets all year? Uh, everything. Uh, health, continuity. In, inabili- their inability defense. to get a stop. Yep. They can't get a stop. Now, when your team gives you this type of effort, like the Brooklyn Nets did, the Brooklyn Nets had no business even being in this game. I'm concerned for the Boston Celtics because the Boston Celtics played well today. Today, I thought those Celtics played great. They moved the ball. They played well offensively. They shot 50-something percent in the first half. They defended exceptionally well. They were sharp. They had a nice game plan, well executed. Brooklyn came out, had seven turnovers, I think, in the first quarter alone. Yep. And they kept hanging around. Now, why am I concerned? Because Kevin Durant is a great player. Great players are not going to play. They're not going to have two games in a row where they play bad. Yeah. He, he wasn't himself today. So you can you can use a pen to put in the books tomorrow, the next game. He's going to have 30 plus. Full out question. Yeah, he's going to he's going to be back to Kevin Durant. Now, the size bothered them. And there was a move that was made. It paid off for the Celtics. The Celtics went small mm-hmm. today to match up. They went small. Okay. They took Daniel Tice out of the game, brought in Derek Williams, and they went small. Derek so White. Derek White, sorry. Derek White, they brought him into the game. Now that lets me know that the, the Nets imposed their will because I haven't seen the Celtics go small a lot during the course of the year. That's true. Okay, so they imposed their will on the game. The Celtics won the game, but it's going to be interesting to see now if coach is for the Celtics, M.A. Odoka, is going to continue with this because maybe that's what he sees for this series. Yeah, I th- and I think I think that is going to be a be an advantage for the Nets. I think this series is far from over. I agree with you. The the Celtics have to win the first two games. Yeah, they have and, to win and still one in Brooklyn. Uh, so my Celtics and five prediction can come true. I think Nick Claxton is going to be huge um, for for the Brooklyn Nets. Goran Dragic, a little bit of scoring off the bench as well was a big bonus. I think also the Celtics trying out that small lineup was in part their three big men had all three got three fouls by about half time, so they had to try something. But it's going to be an interesting series as it unfolds. The Milwaukee Bucks secured the win at home, 93 to 86 over the Chicago Bulls, which was a bit closer than a lot of people anticipated. So I think that was a little bit of the Bulls, uh, the Bucks shaking off their rust and, you know, kind of finding their feet in the series. They were up huge through the lead away a little bit. I just think they kind of maybe, maybe got a bit too comfortable, disrespected the Bulls potentially a little bit, uh, but they took care of business in the end down the stretch. Giannis had a little bit of foul trouble, but he still came away with 27 and 16. Brook Lopez showed why he's so important to this squad, especially down the stretch, making plays on both ends of the floor. Chicago Bulls, DeMar DeRozan, he is really testing me because I really don't want to bring back the DeMar DeFrozen nickname, but six from 25, over from two from three in the playoffs, gives me flashbacks of DeMar DeRozan in Toronto in 43 minutes of action. Uh, Nikola Vucevic had 24 and 17, which was good for him. Um, but uh, overall, I, I, I think it was a valiant effort from the Bulls, but I think that the Bucs are just going to improve every game throughout the series. You know, it's not much to say here. You know, give Chicago credit. I just really wanted to see if Chicago was going to show up. The first seven to 10 minutes of the game, they were down 15, 20, but they were down huge in this game. And I was I was a little disappointed, but to their credit, they bounced back, they fought back, they got themselves back in the game, actually took the lead late in the game. Mm-hmm. And Milwaukee, you know, they found a way, as good teams do, to 
to, you know, get this win. You know, clearly Giannis is the best player on the court. There's no matchup for him. He got in foul trouble here today. I still think it's going to be difficult uh, for the for the Bulls to pull this one through. But um, give Milwaukee credit. They handled their business. They got through it. And uh, they should be primed and ready for game two. Yeah. And the final game of the night to round out all the game ones was the Phoenix Suns at home taking on the New Orleans Pelicans. Uh, the Phoenix Suns, of course, came away with a 110-99 to victory. And I, I think, you know, on paper, right, on paper, this is a nice matchup because the Pelicans, they got length. They got guys that can shoot the ball. They got guys that can cook in the mid range. They got guys that can score on the inside. But however, on the other side of the floor, you've got one of the greatest point guards of all time. You've got one of the MVP candidates this season. You've got a defensive player of the year candidate this season. You've got three big men who can dominate inside the paint. And you've got Jay Crowder, who seems to reside in conference finals for the past few years. So it's a tough first round matchup for Willie Green and the boys in New Orleans. I just think that the Phoenix Suns, every time I watch them, they get scarier and scarier. They had a, they had a big lead. The Pelicans crept in in the third quarter uh, to try to cut the lead down heading into the fourth. But then, you know, Chris Paul really asserted himself down the stretch. He finished with 30 points, 10 assists and seven rebounds, three steals and a block in a masterful performance. BJ, they call you the point guard guru. Do you think that Chris Paul can orchestrate a clean sweep, a gentleman sweep? of this first round series because the Pelicans are in a similar position to the Hawks that we just spoke about in terms of their travel and lack of rest before game one. Well, I thought this was a great, ref- a great uh, representation of the character of this team, right? Mm. We just talked about Atlanta and what they had to go through and I gave them a pass, right? Even, but even though it's a playoffs, look, you know, these guys, they're human, right? It's only human to, you know, to have letdowns and succumb to, you know, sometimes you just don't have it. Somehow, some way, the New Orleans Pelicans, <laughs> they found a way to compete. Yep. Despite, now, a, I, 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 <laughs> despite a horrendous start, you know, after the first yeah. quarter, second quarter, I thought, yo, the game's a wash. Now, I, I, I like the fact when teams find a way, you know, Mo, you hear me talk about that a, a lot. You have to find a way. Give yourself a chance. Well, they did that. Now, I think they're going to come back in game two and really, you know, say they did some things out there. They said, well, you know what? If we can throw the beginning of the game out, maybe it'll give give ourselves a chance. Now, one of the things I don't want to overlook is Coach Willie Green. You know, he coached there with Monty Williams. So he knows that team and he knows that team well. Mm Mm-hmm. And I'm really looking to see how Coach Willie Green attacks this team. Now that both teams have played, they're going to get a little rest, you know, hopefully the night after the game, a little rest tomorrow, and then we start back up again. So I think Coach Green will give us the blueprint on how to beat this team. So I'm really studying this series because I really want to find out what someone who's worked in the inside knows about this team. I love Brandon Ingram, CJ McCullough. I mean, these guys, you could tell right now, New Orleans, they believe. Mm -hmm. They believe right now. They believe they're playing with with confidence. They didn't win, but I love the confidence. And I'm telling you, when they get back to Smoothie King Arena, that that, that, that fan base base should be really proud of this team. And this isn't going to be easy. So I expect them to at least get one game there in, uh, in New Orleans. I like and um, you know, but you know, I, I I think I think they have the attention of so, the players there in Phoenix. They respect this team. I like the in-game adjustments from Monty Williams in this one. You know, Herb Jones, one of the best defenders, one of the best defensive rookies we've seen in a very long time. He was guarding Chris Paul, giving him you know a hard time in the first half, and then they put Brandon Ingram on Devin Booker because Brandon Ingram is obviously very tall, long wingspan. So what they did was they said, okay, we're just going to get Jay Crowder to bring the ball up the court. He's being guarded by Jackson Hayes, who's really a center playing a power forward. And then they're going to put Chris Paul off the ball. And then they're going to run Devin Booker through one, two, three off ball screens. Because why? De- Brandon Ingram can guard him in isolation to use his length and his wingspan. He's not great at navigating, following a smaller guy through screens. So that was getting Booker nice, easy looks, open shots in the mid range. And it was opening up those lob passes to DeAndre A in his side, who, by the way, finished with 21 points, nine rebounds and four blocks. He is earning that money this summer. So, you know, it's a great performance by the Phoenix Suns. I like the fight shown by the Pelicans. 
But most importantly, out of all of these matchups, BJ, I'm so excited for this week to get underway. I can't wait for Monday night. Tonight, we've got the Raptors and Sixers game two. We've got the Jazz and the Mavericks game two. And we've got the Nuggets and the Warriors game two. It's going to be a great week. And you're going to be with us here on the Hoop Genius podcast. That was quite a quick, quick guard. I feel like I spoke really quickly throughout that whole thing. You did. You was you. you uh, hey, you, you're an NBA player. You're playing with pace and space. Hey, right man. now, you were going so fast, I couldn't even follow you. You were going fast, you know. But it's all good. It's more games, more action tomorrow, and um, there are going to be some upsets, Mo. I don't know when they're going to come. We almost had one there in Boston today. Uh, I and, thought we, uh, I thought we didn't call them upsets, BJ. I thought we stopped the amateur stuff and we, we didn't say upsets anymore. Well, yeah, I, I think they are upsets. And, and the reason I'm going to say this I, is when you come in, especially playing at home, you're expected to win. Mm-hmm. There's pressure for you to win at home, right? You that, That's the first sign of a good team. Can you defend your home court? Yeah. Before you can go on the road, you have to you have to ha- establish that. When we are at home, we have to win. So, you know, like watching Minnesota go into Memphis, all right? I don't think we – we need to say this about Memphis. Memphis, to me, looks like a team that hasn't played in about a week or so. Yeah, rusty. Yeah, J- John Morant was out for injuries or what have you. Jaron Jackson was out. The team did – you know, they're playing at home. And there's that pressure. Everyone was showing up there in Memphis to see us win because now we're expected to win. But you know what? This is a new position. But you know what it reminded me of, though? The the Timberwolves reminded me of Memphis last year. You know, when they came in through the playing tournament and they won game one on the road in Utah, and then the Utah Jazz woke up and won the next four. That's kind of the vibe that I got from this. Like, the Timberwolves are one year away from really being it. You know, Anthony Edwards right now is reminding me of John Morant last year because we all watched John Morant last year. By the way, this is why I don't think he's the most proof player because we all watched him in the postseason last year and we're like, wow, next season, he's going to take over. You see what I'm saying? Where I'm, where I'm coming from with this? That's yeah, the, you the know, kind I, of look I heard that I got some from players. Me. Yeah, I, I've heard some players talking about, about that. But let me tell you something. You know, I respectfully disagree with that, with that take because it's one thing to be a role player on a team and increase your numbers because you're getting more minutes, you know, or increase your numbers because suddenly now a player goes down and you went from a player who were getting no plays or limited plays and suddenly now the coach is calling five or six plays for you. But let me tell you the most difficult transition in this league. Very rarely do you go from being a role player to a superstar. Very rarely do you come into this league and suddenly you ascend to a level where you're carrying a team from one year to another. And you go and you're going to a team like John John Morant went to the Memphis Grizzlies. So John Morant suddenly now we're saying this, I mean, this young man is the number two seed or the Memphis Grizzlies. They are the number two seed in the Western conference. That's an incredible jump. Yes. Like you just don't do, you just, this isn't like, you know, yeah, they're but the he, seventh or eighth. He, he, he's the number two pick in the draft in his third season. He should be making a jump. And the whole Grizzlies team made a jump because they were so uh, well, successful well, without him. Well, Mo, if I could hold them to there. Now, Mo, we live in a league where the number one and the number two pick aren't the number one and the new, number two pick like they were 15 years mm-hmm. ago. We live in a league now, Mo, where what are we saying? Everyone is what? Player development. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Mo. Now, Mo, you can't say he's the number one pick and then say this guy is. Exact. Now we're coming in as the number one pick and then they say he's going to be. He's player but, development. Well, speaking of number one picks, man, I just wish Zion was playing in this Pelican series because it would make things so much more interesting but we're gonna have to dive into those conversations later on this week bj that's what we've got time for today's episode they have released the top three candidates for each of the nba awards 
which we're going to be discussing later in this week. So if you want to hear those discussions, you want to hear more recaps of the playoffs, more predictions, more breakdowns of the game, make sure you subscribe to us here at the Hoop Genius Podcast. I want to say a big thank you to our friends at Sirius XM Radio who had us on over the weekend for a little play- playoff preview action. Gerald and Rick, uh, appreciate you guys. Mo's making, his, make, Mo's making his debut in the States. He's taking hey. over the States. He <laughs> came across the pond. <laughs> slowly but surely, man. Slowly but surely, we're going global. Mr. Worldwide, where's Pitbull? And, um, you know, BJ, thank you once again. It's been good. And another weekend, another week of playoff action in the books. Let's see what this week has in store. I hope there's some upsets. I hope there's some surprises. And I hope there are a couple more wins for the Boston Celtics. Thank you guys for tuning in. Thank you guys for listening. Make sure you leave us a review, leave us a rating. And most importantly, until next time, get buckets.